Are, are we gonna? What are we gonna? Are you gonna kick it off from so, the beginning? Sort of yeah. Thing? So shall we start oh, with oh. Graham Norton? What? Yeah, let's, let's start, start with Graham with Norton. Norton. I'm going to go in a bit. You'll just have to be patient with me because I'm going to start with Norton and I'm going to quote a little bit from the catechism. <laughs> then I'm going to read the Bible. No, then I'm going to... Um... <laughs> Starting with Genesis. <laughs> Start... <laughs> and then you go. So, there's, you know, we fluff our way in a bit. Brilliant. Just great. 60 seconds of sixty seconds of fluff. Yes, Gavin. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. Let's fluff it up. <clears throat> Okay. Right. Hi and welcome to Catholic Unscripted Episode 5. I'm Catherine Bennett. I'm Mark Lambert. I'm Gavin Ashenden. Thanks for watching so far. We're doing quite well, aren't we, Mark? What were our views for the last couple of episodes? Yeah, I think one of them got about uh, two point two thousand or something like that. Was it, Gavin? Two point five. It's it's it's, it's marvellous from a standing start. We've got people who are watching us, and I'm getting emails um, almost every day from people saying, "We're well, not quite sure why we like you, but we do." <laughs> so please keep it up. And so here we are. That five is is keeping it up. And um, and and thank you both. I, I I must say I look forward to this enormously through the week. I think it's 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 wonderful to have you both as as conversation pals in the kingdom. So. Thank you both for making the time. No yeah, worries, thank you. And thanks for uh, watching so far and for commenting. Continue to comment and join the conversation and we'll try to respond as much as we can. Today, our, our attention has been drawn this week to Graham Norton, who on his show last night had a guest who was talking about her new role in a film called Call Jane, uh, which is about a collection of women who performed between 10 and 11,000 abortions in the space of four years. Uh, Graham Norton was saying it wasn't made as a response to the um, overturning of Roe v. Wade. They had it in the in the mix anyway, but then uh, they think it's really important since the overturning of Roe v. Wade. So really, we want to get into that. And Graham Norton also spoke this week about cancel culture. So there's a little link between these, which I want to get to. So I'm going to start, if you'll excuse me, with a little introduction here, uh, with a quote from our catechism. Human life is sacred because from its beginning, it involves the creative action of God and it remains forever in a special relationship with the creator who is its sole end. God alone is the Lord of life from its beginning until its end. No one can under any circumstance claim for himself the right directly to destroy an innocent human being. That's Catechism uh, 2258. Well, I wanna to go to some statistics for you. So in England and Wales in 2020, there were 210,860 abortions performed. That equates to 577 abortions per day of the year. 42% of these were repeat abortions. Women between the ages of 20 to 24 had the highest rate of abortion. And this is, these are the women who would be, who would have been around at the time of uh, Tony Blair's introduction of sex education into schools, one of the aims of which was to reduce abortions. And in fact, this woman on Graham Norton said yesterday, if you want to lower the abortion rate, sex education is the way to do it. Well, the statistics don't bear that out. Uh, so what we have de facto is abortion on demand for any reason up to 24 weeks and up to birth for disability. Just a little note on cancel culture. According to the Alliance of Pro-Life Students, uh, one in three students were deplatformed um, who were speaking up for life, pro-life. More than two thirds have witnessed another student being discriminated against or harassed for holding pro-life views. And more than 70% have felt unable to speak about their views in lectures and seminars. So Graham Norton this week talking about cancel culture, um, promoting this film that uh, is saying uh, promoting abortion as healthcare and how necessary it is. Well, so the question today is really, how is it possible that so many reasonable and educated people can accept this atrocity? Gavin, what can you tell us about this? Well, I know a reasonable and well-educated person who accepted the atrocity myself. Um, and so I think there, there are two reasons. It's going to be like the Spanish Inquisition now. 
Um, three reasons. The, I mean, two, two of the obvious reasons are, first of all, people don't think about it. And so it's part of the rhetoric of our culture that uh, a poor woman gets pregnant and her autonomy is threatened. She becomes, if you like, a victim of her own pregnancy in this narrative. And so she has to be set free from something that would otherwise constrain her. So that and people stop with that. They don't go any further than that. And then there's an argument about, well, what is it that she's constrained by? What's the nature of this of this thing growing inside her? And there's no scientific answer to that. There's there's this content continuity of, di of dividing cells until this this thing becomes a baby and is born. There's no moment when it, there's a gear change from being a clump of cells to being a human being. So then there are only two responses to that. One is it's never it's never a human being until it's born, which is the way the progressives have ended up with, which of course is ludicrous. Um, any parent who's seen its child even partially developed in the womb and felt this instinctive leap of, of creative uh, paternal maternal love knows it's complete nonsense. Or you say it's a viable human being from the moment it's conceived, which is the Catholic position and makes a lot more sense rationally. So the first reason I think is people don't think about it. I think the second reason is you you have to be born again you, you have to have the capacity to think metaphysically or spiritually um and uh, i don't think i mean it quite in the sense that that you have to be born again to see jesus so that's quite similar to that but you do have to be willing to think beyond a material and functional universe that most people spend their lives in i was i was um exploded out of it in the middle of a bbc program i was hosting when I, when I had a faith and ethics program and somebody called in to wanting to, to, to rant about abortion against it. I thought, oh, for goodness sake. And then one of the things you did when people were having were going on a bit was you, you checked the internet. So I thought, well, I better look up the figures. So I, so I Googled. And uh, in 2010, when this was, there had been 6 million aborted fetuses since the act. And, and because I'm, per, uh, I'm uh, patrilineally Jewish, 6 million... <laughs> Is, a, is the Holocaust number. And I immediately said, that's a Holocaust. I, I, was, I was taken in to see the editor of the, of the radio <laughs> station the following day. Uh, and they said to me, if you ever say that again, you'll be out of the door in the middle of your program. You're not allowed to say that. But what it did do is it set me thinking. And as I began to think about the implications of our doing away with, 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 with 6 million children, uh, I then thought my way through from the clump of cells to the human being thing. And it was it was the spiritual implications that kicked me into the spiritual realm. And once you've seen it, you can't stop it. And then, of course, in also in terms of the spiritual uh, dynamics, the sense that you're in a universe where good and evil are struggling is that sacrifice and above all child sacrifice has been a means of strengthening evil. The prospect that we have been aborting our children and sacrificing them to 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 evil uh, for the last 50 years and thereby strengthening evil and weakening weakening the common good is but not only horrifying but compelling so i think you you have to think your way there and most people start off from a place where they don't think about it and they don't want to think about it I think my, like my own experience, I've been on the March for Life. I've been the, the um, marshal for a few for a number of years now in London, which has been really fantastic. It's a fantastic family sort of day out with lots of clergy and uh, lots of young children, and it's very very uh, happy and joyful sort of experience. But the vitriol aimed at you from the people who are pro-abortion is shocking. And one thing that I've really experienced is that they don't want to talk to us. They don't want to engage. And I think that is because when, as you say, when you're confronted with the reality of this, there is there is nowhere to go morally. You have to accept that. The only way you can accept abortion, really, is if you accept that it's okay to kill some people. If they're, for what reason? Largely, I mean, obviously the arguments are always that it's because of... Um, some defect or illness and usually the argument goes that the mother's going to die or something like that but as Catherine just pointed out in the statistics that's not a reality the reality is this is about convenience and this is about a lack of consequences and society sells this to us by saying that there that there is a way out you know and the church has always fallen on the side of saying 
all of our actions have consequences and none more so than our sexuality. And this is the consequence. Uh, it's a lie to say that you can get out once you've made that decision that there's some easy way out of it that isn't going to cost you anything. You know, it is going to cost you. It's going to cost you a lot. You know, in, like I don't think a lot of women recover from an, from an abortion in my experience, you know, women who've gone through it. So I think this is a, te I mean, it is an awful thing. And I understand, I just, I find it so difficult to understand how it's gone so mainstream that people think that it's, so acceptable i just don't i really is it's beyond rational thought to me yeah it's staggering i think gavin's quite right it's it's really saying making a decision about when life begins and if we don't accept that life begins at conception then it's some arbitrary point after that and then you say well why that arbitrary point and so then the same arguments could be used to justify infanticide so once you go down that road, once you say, well, actually, there isn't there isn't a, a distinct living and whole human being uh, with a unique genetic makeup at conception. But sometime later, then you're well, that's dangerous ter territory. And I want to go to your um, your point about um, the grounds. So what happens in the abortion debate is people often say come in with, well, you know, what about a woman who's been ra raped or. Um, you know it's cases of incest and they come with these these test cases these, Case. these limit cases mm -hmm. and then they then they say so therefore you must support abortion and uh, how could you deny women well the truth of it is that um of those of those abortions that i talked to you about in 2020 just just under 211,000 206,000 roughly uh were uh, performed under ground c which is a vague risk to the mental or physical health of a mother if she continues only seven only seven out of those were because the mother's life would be saved by it and that's a separate question anyway which Aquinas addressed we know that the the, the principle of double effect and then we've got 121 only for grounds a and b which is a risk to the mother's life if she continues the pregnancy uh, nearly four thousand on the grounds of disability and abnormalities by far by far most abortions are performed for matters of convenience and that's the truth of it and it, and abortion is used as a uh, as a late well it, it's not a contraception by the way because to contracept is to prevent conception so it's conception would have already taken place so it's a early abortifacent i was quite struck in the uh, graham norton episode by the way in which the uh, heroines of these films who were set out to be sort of um rescuing angels who were helping mm. uh, women in the most terrible trouble avoid backstreet abortions um, of course when you do a backstreet abortion if you're determined to kill the child in the first place one of the things they didn't talk about was the way in which adoption agencies have always been there the church has always provided a a safety net by providing adoption homes and then because not everybody can have a child who wants one allowing children to be adopted by their parents. One of the most dreadful things about the Equalities Act was the way in which uh, Catholic adoption agencies were closed down because the state decided it would be better to have no adoption agencies than ones that didn't uh, um, offer children to same-sex couples. So this, the state has a very arbitrary set of moral values which don't make sense and don't work. But the mispresentation of the state of the women is part of the false narrative which affects the way most people think about it. So, you know, my body, my choice, the mother is the victim instead of the child as the victim. Um, and, and, and you hardly ever hear in the public secular space any sense at all that the child has a right to life. Again, one of the, the, the rights of the child are always missing in terms of the gay marriage debate. Uh, the, one of the great problems was the procuring of children to make gay marriages look more, more like real relationships. Um, but if there's a human right at all, it's to have access to your, to your biological mother and father. And the state seem to have no difficulty at all in depriving newborn children of that access. So one of the things we don't hear is the rights of the child. Human beings at their most vulnerable state, um, the state is, is, is ruthless and, and inhuman when it comes to anyone who's in the process of, of being grown in the womb. We have to you know, support people in crisis pregnancies. And uh, probably the best approach is to look after people and to make sure 
that there is somewhere, some alternative, you know, somewhere to go. Unfortunately, it feels like the state is, you know, with the new abortion buffer zone thing and they're, they're working against anyone providing any alternative to abortion. It's mm. just like there's this demonic thing that we must have abortion. I mean, it really does look supernatural, doesn't it? I suppose I can say that on a Catholic yeah. discussion channel you know um, but i think the whole thing only makes sense when you deal with the supernatural yeah. and we can talk mm. in terms of the psychology of, of grief and bereavement at, at mothers who lose their children and and of course there's this difference between the rational part of the brain and the unconscious i mean uh, catherine was was talking about earlier on when she talked about the effect it has on mothers so yes i'm sure at a rational level people think this is a good way of solving my immediate problem but there's something profound in the human and maternal soul, which once it's conceived a child is not going to forget the child. And, and, and then when you add to it the fact that it was the mother who killed it and the mother knows she killed it, but of course suppresses it, then what you've got is a prof profound psychic wound operating at a psychological level. But, but we have to use language of supernatural because I think it's one of the things that explains the state that the world is in today. In a world where you have a conflict between supernatural good and supernatural evil, expressing itself in, through the material and political realm, the, the, the consequences of sacrificing our children to either, at the easiest, a principle of convenience, but, but God, all, all principles are gods to some extent, to either the god of convenience or something much darker, the god of anti-life, the, the god of murder, the god of matricide, and we know the name of that god. Um, our society has done itself the most, has it's imposed most dreadful wound upon itself. And I think many of the e evils that are taking place today, including including ecological disruption and 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 mental illness amongst children, uh, and, and uh, economic injustice. I think they're resonances of this really serious, profound holocaust of the innocence that our society in the last 60 years has performed. Either it's a spiritual offence, in which case it is one of the grossest ones one can imagine, and it would have an effect, or it isn't. But it's very difficult to conceive of it, of having no metaphysical purchase, given the fact that we're doing away with human souls. Mm. It seems to have fallen away from um, the Christian discussion as well doesn't it you know i know um i approached our local baptist church about um supporting march for life and and you know they take a very pro scripture you know uh, sort of uh what would be the word orthodox christian perspective to all of these issues but they really weren't interested in getting involved in this which i found really quite strange when you go to the March of Life, it's an, an ecumenical, um, there's all people from all different churches, but the majority of people there are Catholics. It's really interesting that this is supported by the Catholic Church. Again, we come back to where the fight is being fought, you know, where it's where the, and there are, there's Anglicans and Methodists and all kinds of people come, but it really is the Catholics at the forefront of the fight there again, and um, certainly you know from an organizational point of view and i think you need to have those spiritual weapons at your disposal in order to fight this fight i don't have to i'm getting a bit deep here with it but i do it is something that frightens me you know, i do exactly as you yeah. said i think that we as a society for us to endorse and to continue murdering our children at this sort of unprecedented increasing constantly in, is terrifying it terrifies me it really the way that it's got to change our attitude towards being parents and and what it means you know it's again it's all about consequence and um the the morality of objective acts of you know this is something objectively that we can say is evil but again we say society we can see and observe society is moving away from an objective understanding of morality to a more relative model uh, and that and that sort of makes all these things okay doesn't it Gavin that uh, that makes it easier to accept all kinds of evils if you've got a utilitarian mindset or well you don't even recognize the difference between good and evil mm. you only recognize useful and non-useful but about I, the to two points that I, I wanted to respond to in what you said the first was the irrational anger that you received during the march for life 
And again, irrational anger is usually a sign of some form of, of, of sort of, I was going to say demonic, but one wants to use one's words very carefully. It is demonic, but, but, but the moment you find something rationally disproportionate or disproportionate to rationality, you're entitled to ask questions about whether the language of the or better describes them. And it seems to me no doubt at all that, that the rage against people bearing witness to the sanctity of human life is from people who are demonized and only possessed. Possession is something that's very rare and hardly ever happens. We all get demonized. We, we all, in, in the spiritual, we, we all find the influence of bad angels. One of my favorite characters when I grew up uh, came from the Don Camillo books. Uh, there was an Italian uh, journalist called uh, Goreschi, uh, Giovanni Goreschi, I think. And, and all through the cartoons, this priest was shown with his guardian angel on one shoulder and the demonic angel on the other shoulder. And much of his day was spent arbitrating between these two. And I, I whilst it was um, accessible for a child, I think it's a profoundly sophisticated way of understanding the dynamics of the spiritual life. And these are people for whom the dark angel has been whispering loudest and they're outraged at the influence of people who've been responding to the to their guardian angels. That's the first thing. The other thing is the difference between Catholic and Protestant views. This isn't very well expressed because I haven't had time to think about it properly. But there's something about Protestant churches which, which, which they are cultures of the enlightenment. They're cultures of, of the rationality that's flowed from the 17th century onwards. And, and whilst they understand, uh, of course they do, the, the, the whole business of being born again uh, and the, the, the spiritual life, they've got blank bits of the jigsaw, I think, that only the Catholic Church has. There isn't a kind of whole, a, a theologically, a full picture of the theological map. So if a child, if, if, if a fetus can't respond to Jesus in any way, it doesn't easily fit into the map of being born again and living the Christian life. Mm. Um, but the Catholic Church, having been thinking moral thoughts for 2000 years, has a fairly profound and well well uh, inked in map of the whole of life, which is one of the reasons why uh, living as a Catholic gives one so many more resources to deal with the moral conundrums that, that we face because for 2000 years, people have been putting them into categories and working them out. So we have a very good map. And I think that's why Catholics are there in force in order to defend the unborn child, because yeah. we're not, we don't belong to uh, a church that has done most of its theology in terms of in the categories of the enlightenment it's um it, it's it's far richer than that yeah i would say the other thing is that if there is a supernatural dimension to this that's important for our whole culture mm. surely it's important that our bishops are talking about this as our as the as our pastors as our teachers and that our priests as well are i mean obviously it's difficult to talk about abortion from the pulpit but it should be something that we should be talking about and mobilizing surely on a parish level this is part That's of the problem. Difficult. Sorry, go Catherine, you're, you're go on, go talking on, go on. you go. Yeah, I'll do it in 30 seconds, then, then do your part. First of all, you have to you have to recognize women who've had abortions listening to you. And 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 it's not our job to condemn them. Um uh it, it's not our job to 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 heap um weights on people's consciences. No, and I think they're frozen. wounded. Aren't they? I think they need our love and our I've help. Frozen. If you've frozen, I probably have too. Yeah, you, you, I think you've frozen. I'll wait until it unfreezes. You're, you're fine now. Fine, okay. Yeah. So it's very difficult to talk about abortion because inevitably one must recognise there'll be people who've had an abortion mm. in front of you. And, and it's not for us to make them feel much worse about it. That's not our job at all. Our job is to bring people to forgiveness. Yeah. And so we have to go very light on the, on the condemnation in, um, indeed. But it's very difficult given, given the moral violation, the scale of moral violation that abortion is. It's very difficult to find the right way of talking about it in public to people um, who who will already be suppressing feelings of guilt in order to allow them to know that they can be forgiven and then deal with the consequences, which for begin with a mass for the dead baby uh, and, 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 and forgiveness for having done this act. So talking about it requires great sensitivity and kindness and love. Uh, and also it, 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 it sets off people. I once talked about it in, when I was a chaplain to the queen, I was asked to, um, I was preaching one of my sermons in St. James and there was a lovely, in those days it was a lovely senior chaplain. And I, I said to him, you know, how, how, how high octane would you like the sermon to be today, Father? And he said, he 
says, it's been so boring of late. Would you would you put it nearer 10 than 5? So I, <laughs> I, I did, and I preached on abortion. And in the middle of it, about 25 American women tourists who were in the congregation got up, turned their backs on me, and walked out. So if you are going to talk about it, there will be consequences. Yeah, well, I, I was just going to say the same as you, in fact, Gavin, there, about we've got to be careful because we it's like this thread runs through a lot of our conversations and actually runs through the whole of our church, the whole of uh, the teachings of our faith, which is that we have to make a distinction between person and act. And it's perfectly proper and right to to condemn the action, but to love the person. Uh, Pope Benedict said we have to be um, intransigent with sin and indulgent with the sinner. And this is it when exactly right when it comes to abortion. So there were two things that just came up from what you two were saying. First of all, we mustn't be afraid to, to call it what it is. It's diabolic. It's child sacrifice on a huge scale. And that's what it is. What is sacrifice if not offering, giving something up? To gain something what is abortion if not uh now i'm not going to these limit cases i'm not going to the but generally speaking what is abortion if not sacrificing your child giving it up for something else uh, a, an easier life a richer life um now this is what's happening we are sacrificing children on a huge scale peter crave spoke uh recently about um uh, islam and how critical a lot of the christians can be about islam and the the acts of terror and he said when you stack it up against the genocide that's happening in the wombs in western civilization it doesn't even come close to the amount of uh people that have been murdered in the womb um so it's diabolic for sure but secondly i think to, to that point about judgment in a sense people are victims of a, a terrible education they're victims of having the wool pulled over their eyes um they they they're not believing that they're murdering anybody so the so so if, so what it's incumbent upon you say the bishops the priests us uh, the church to to be able to make clear what abortion is and why it's wrong this is so important and it cannot be ignored because of the climate crisis we can talk about the climate crisis all we like and it's important to do so and the, and the stewardship of the environment but not at the cost of you know sacrificing human life of abortion of these it's ridiculous to prioritize issues. the climate I, you know like I, I understand the climate crisis is an important thing and mm. i'm not you know i'm quite i'm quite interested in it myself but this it's not the competence of the church to be talking of you know I, when we've got this abortion thing going on i just think it's crazy and that they're not stopping like we're talking what we're talking about graham norton you know mm, it's yeah. it's mainstream and these people are having these discussions on the radio and on the television i try to look up the graham norton thing on google and immediately a warning comes up at the top of the screen with healthcare information about abortion you know they want they we are extremists for opposing abortion uh, it's just extraordinary. And because we're not engaging the dialogue, one of the things that, you know, as a catechist in the church, I always we always do it as part of the confirmation program. And at the end, we, we sort of ask some moral questions. And you will find that 95% of the kids there at 14, 15, all think abortion is fine. What is going on? What well, is going also, on? In well, well, one, one of the things that's going on is that, that our children have been indoctrinated in feminism. Yes. But it's exactly. from the from the very beginning by, by all the media yeah and and as a woman i i i hate this um idea that it's the feminist position is to is to support abortion um i mean what does abortion do but allow a woman to be used as a vessel and for a man not to take responsibility when she becomes pregnant it's easy why wouldn't men want to support abortion men who want to have sex with women without consequence why wouldn't they you, you you have sex with a woman she gets pregnant you get rid of the baby job done it's it's not obvious to me that the feminist response is to support abortion and and speaking leaving putting the spiritual life to one side it would be quite an intellectual feat to be able to explain to people that the categories that they've been using and working out their moral responses from are mistaken mm -hmm. and they need to adopt entirely new categories you know beginning with the fact that life begins at conception uh, and and that the mother is not a victim in ninety five percent of the cases. These these are shocking ideas to 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 everybody, let alone children. But the other thing I think, is if we want to really do something to save 
Holocaust unborn, the most effective way is to make people Catholic Christians because they, they, they then start with the willingness to rethink their whole position, their whole yeah. metaphysical universe. Uh, and also they have the, 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 the spiritual capacity to grasp the sanctity of life. Once you understand that God made you, God loves you, God dies for you. It's not a far stretch to understand the importance of, of, of saving our babies in the way that God saves us. So I think evangelism really ought to be one of our responses. Yes, we must argue. Yes, we must stand up for mm. it. Uh, absolutely swap rational um, rash, rational blows with each other but I think the most important thing it would be to bring people to Christ so that they have this new life this new understanding and therefore a capacity to know spiritually psychologically physically politically what's going on you're quite right evangelization is important but w w what's the point in bringing people to Christ in becoming a Catholic Christian and then not forming them there's no formation there's a problem in our Catholic schools where young people are leaving Catholic education and they don't understand what the church teaches. Why is this happening? What's what are Catholic? What do Catholic schools exist for? Well, and if it's not happening in schools, then it should be happening. Well, it should be happening at home first and foremost, anyway. Yeah. But you, this is the disconnect that we see in the church, isn't it? And it's like all the discussions that are going on are about, oh, well, how do we change this disconnect? But while there's so much confusion at the moment mm. being spread in the church um, about issues like this then no, who knows what they're actually teaching? And if any, you know, we're all involved in catechesis in some respect or another. Yeah. And you find that, you know, over the last few years, you've constantly got people coming up to you when you're teaching a, a, a dogmatic truth from the catechism and yeah. people are saying, oh, well, Pope Francis says the opposite. And, you know, then you've got to have a whole nother conversation, which is very, very awkward and difficult and unpleasant. For a Catholic, so uh, until I personally, I feel I know loads of catechists, and they all feel the same. Everyone that I know who's involved, engaged in teaching the faith feels that um, we're being undermined from the top at the moment. So, you know, we need to sort that out. Which does I think moves us. us. Does that bring <laughs> us on to our? Why next... do you always butt in before me? I was just about to. Gavin was about to tell me what to do. Sorry, well, I'm doing sorry. it, Gavin. I'm sorry. doing it. No, I. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I, I, actually, I saw your features become suddenly more mobile. And I Did thought, you? she's on it. She's I'm on, on it. it. I'm on it. I'm on it. But before I get to it, I wanted to say there should always be that connection between the home, the school, the parish. And that shouldn't be broken. There should be no undermining. That should be a, a complete thread so that, you know, when you send your child to a Catholic school, you can trust that they're going to uphold the faith that you have instilled in your children at home. That should Brilliant. be a given. Um, and now I'm moving on. So, I just like to say my, my impatience is not gender related. I wasn't impatient because I'm a man. I was impatient because I'm, I'm impatient. Okay. All right. So I'm moving on. Um, impatient. I apologise. <laughs> it's fine. Um, whilst marking the uh, 60th anniversary of the start of the Second Vatican Council recently, we're moving on to Pope Francis again. Uh, he gave a homily in which he attacked uh, traditionalism as being evidence of infidelity to the church. He said traditionalists look backwards, longing for a bygone world, and it's not evidence of love, but of infidelity. It's my view that uh, Pope Francis seems to have mixed up uh, tradition and nostalgia. Uh, but what do you make of this, Mark? <laughs> <laughs> Let's just Please sigh and give up, shall we? Him. Please, someone stop him. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I just I, I, you don't have to be a theologian or even have much acquaintance with theology to recognize that it's just it doesn't make any logical sense in English or in Italian or in Spanish even you know what he's saying um, you know what I think this is I think the problem is that this is a project for our Holy Father who we love and respect and we're trying to learn it's important that we're challenged the Pope's job is to challenge us so I'm um, I'm trying to, to listen to my Holy Father and be challenged by it. And I am challenged, <laughs> massively challenged on a regular basis. And just trying to think it through in the context of where we are. And where what I see at the moment is that we have had, um, I, when I was studying theology, uh, one of the lecturers said to me once, we live in the shadow of a great council. We've only had 20 odd great councils. And it takes a good few years for, for the church to sort to come to some sort of balance after a cat. And we, so we're living in the shadow of one of those great councils. Was it important that we had a council? Yeah, I think the church was 
um, and, and the whole world was going through an extraordinary period of change. I think it's important to put it in the context that it was in the 60s. It did take place in the 60s. Mm -hmm. The language is the council of the, you know, the, the problems they were addressing were the, pro were the problems that, that they were experiencing in the 60s. And we all know that the rate of change has increased massively since then. So we, we, we've got different problems now, really. We've got, so constantly, go, like the Pope says not to go backwards, but he's constantly going backwards to the 60s. And I, I'm not sure that those, that the answers that we got then were the right answers. You know, we've got to sort of take the period of time that's gone in between and take that into account and look at the way things have changed. And if you look at, I mean, the, the, the constant harping on about rigidity, you know, you've got, we've got a, yeah. a period of time in the church where it seems like the biggest challenge facing most priests, most uh, parishes is getting people back to mass after COVID with all the, zoom stuff that was going on and everything um so the pope makes his priority stopping the people who are going to mass from going to mass now they can't go to mass i mean this it just doesn't make any sense at all to me it just seems like complete nonsense but it is it does make sense if you recognize what he's doing and what he's doing it seems to me and i love gary's perspective on this is that he is developing a hermeneutic of rupture now um, that may or may not be familiar to you to, to listeners or watchers or viewers whatever we've got um and that the that but that was a term that was used by pope benedict XVI to talk about the way that we uh embed ourselves in the tradition you know tradition from the latin tradere which means to hand on so it's it's not like we're not going backwards when we talk about tradition we are an apostolic faith so we're using what as come before us and we recognize the treasure that was been handed on to us you know we don't make up new stuff we our faith is apostolic in nature it comes from christ and the apostles and so pope benedict was saying that you know we we, we can't embrace ideas or say that the spirit of vatican ii or whatever is at odds with what has been handed on to us from the apostles it has to be in continuity so that's the hermeneutic of continuity and basically he was using that term to argue against the hermeneutic of rupture and Pope Francis is the hermeneutic of rupture. You hear it time and time again. You hear it from the, the, the synod, you know, whatever Mario Gret is, is heading up, um, which he's been promoted way beyond his competence. Um, in, and he's been promoted because he's done things that the Pope wants, you know, nefarious things that the Pope wants. Unfortunately, this is the way it's all shifty and working in that direction. But basically, the Pope is saying, it seems to me, that there is a complete break at Vatican II and we have got a new church that has emerged. And that new church is being directed by the Holy Spirit. And it, But interestingly, another interesting dimension to it is, it seems that this new church that's broken out of the old rigid Pelagian church, all these terms that he uses, um, is going back to ideas that have been already defunct. So to get to sort of technical, you know, We've got this idea of um, fundamental option, for example, in moral theology, which was the idea that there was, as long as you, it didn't matter what you did, if you did good things or bad things, that, that was less important than that you had, you lived your life for Christ at the end of the day. That was the most important thing. And Pope John Paul, Pope St. John Paul II, wrote a whole fantastic encyclical. I highly recommend it. And perhaps we'll put it in the show notes, the link to it, because it's available on the Vatican website called Veritatis Splendor, the Splendor of Truth, where he, he said acts are always objective. You know, the church has always taught that certain moral acts are good and certain moral acts are bad. And th this idea of fundamental option um, was promoted by um, a, th a moral theologian called Bernard Haring. And he's someone that the Pope has said that he admires and he's someone that he's promoting. So uh, what I'm saying is there are lots of different clues in... And some of them are peripheral, like the homily that he gave that you're referring to, Catherine, where, you know, he, he, it's his most open attack on, well, if, not counting Traditionis Custodis, which is just just extraordinary that a Pope is banning the mass, that that is what a Pope thinks should happen, is that liturgy, people who want to worship God in the most um, developed way that they can, or the most holy and reverent way that they can, they're the people who are the problem in the church. I'm sorry, it's just nonsense. 
Um, but you, so you can see that there's that there's those sort of level of confrontation. But you can see on the way that he's developing moral theology, he's pushing back, you know, unfortunately, to the fifties and this, you know, <laughs> which is just uh, the, the whole thing doesn't make any any sense to me at all, Gavin. I don't know what you <laughs> I don't know what you make of it or. Well, it make it makes sense in the sense that I think I can understand why it's happening. I think there are three categories we we can look at. There's the philosophical, the strategic, and the spiritual. But before I do that, I I've tried to put myself in Francis' position and and see it through his eyes. And I think I can do that. I think there was a period of time when I was a young evangelical when I very much liked imminence because imminence brought Jesus close. And my problem was that God had been a long way off for most of my life. And so on the kind of transcendent imminent scale, I didn't like transcendence very much because it, God seemed to be, you know, big, powerful, slightly dangerous and a long way off out there. Whereas being born again as an evangelical meant Jesus was my friend. The Holy Spirit was fixing my heart. I liked all the things informal and tactile and, and uh, accessible. And in that sense, I found some clergy and some liturgy very difficult. I found the more ritualistic uh, litur liturgy and, and probably the more, well, I would say I'd use Francis's word for the moment. So some clergy looked like they were rigid and they were unfriendly. And so I, I can put myself in his position and say where there is rigidity and unfriendliness and lack of imminence and lack of intimacy with Jesus, this is not good. Um, but unfortunately, the position can't be described by just saying that. Because we've got these other three categories. So the, the, the philosophical, strategic and metaphysical, I think I had it. Um, so philosophically, um, he's mistaken. As, as Mark was saying, the 1950s and the 1960s were not a new period of development and hope and um, superculture. They were the beginnings of a period of profound decay and apostasy. And one of the things Vatican do, unfortunately, did was it set itself up as if the new culture was something good and challenging which the church had to adapt to in order to become multilingual. What it didn't realize that we now know was that the culture was not good uh, and any challengingness it had in it was going to be ch a challenge towards the church and want the wanting of the church's destruction. Um, and so this attempt to modify the church to cope with this new secular culture mistook technological progress for cultural progress it was wrong and that's not what's happened at all quite the opposite the church has the culture has turned on the church and is hoping to destroy it and metaphysically it was wrong because one of the things that happened as you as, as particularly as you become a catholic or you go into the tradition is you begin to see that the demons really don't like the mass and they don't like latin and so just in terms of having a more profound purchase um uh, the Latin Mass is one of the it's one of our nuclear options. It's very, very powerful indeed. Uh, and a number of people who are starved of transcendence. The problem for a lot of people in our culture is not the one I had when they're growing up. They're, they've got imminence out of their ears. Everything is intimate. Everything is tacked up. Everything is right up close. Uh, what they're longing for now is a sense of the authority of God, of the power of God, of the majesty and of the awe of God, so that they can give their narcissistic selves to something much bigger and more important. And in that sense, the church always has to act as a balance, an antidote to the, dis the imbalance of society. So metaphysically, uh, this is the moment for the Latin mass <laughs> in our dealings with society. And we know that that's true because look at how people are flocking to it. So for now, for the Pope, to miscategorize the metaphysics of the situation is really quite serious. To treat something profoundly good and holy and powerful for the church as if it is an evil is a really serious error for a clergyman to make. And this is where it becomes so difficult. And I'm very aware that now we're, we're in a, a serious minefield. And I've tried to avoid this minefield for three years, but there's no, there's no point. Too many people are struggling with the implications of uh, of the mistakes in the papal office not to be able to talk about it so we love the papal office and for me for me the chair of peter is the key to uh, the, as an antidote to all the demonic division that the satan has wreaked upon the church i'm not going to give up my devotion to the see of peter or or to the promise that on occasions 
when the whole church has to come together to decide a matter of doctrine, we can depend upon the Holy Spirit to, to, to teach the truth, which is where the claim for infallibility comes from. But this particular holder of the Sea of Peter, he <laughs> and what we have to pray for is that the church survives his mistakenness. But as you quite rightly say, we have to love him. We, we do criticism in a different way as Catholics, as Christians. We do it with love and we don't give up the respect. We do it with pity. It, it's a, it's a, it's a, one has to pity somebody who has that degree of responsibility from God for the church and who is actually doing harm rather than good. So we have to pray, we have to pray that his successor will have the capacity and the gifts to heal and put right the damage that's being done at the moment, but also not to give in to the damage. When the Pope says, when he, when he speaks, about rigidity and traditionalism. Catherine was quite right when she said he mistakes uh, traditionalism with nostalgia. Um, he's mistaken, but we can tell him he's mistaken without, without um, sinning and without damaging the church. In fact, it's quite important we should say so and not damage the church because we have to help people who are generally confused and upset and hurt and who know in their bones there's something very badly wrong. We have to be able to articulate what it is that's wrong and pray that God will allow it to be put right in, in due course. Absolutely. Um, I suppose that, uh, that there has always been three attitudes towards the council that, that I, in my time anyway, um, one was the spirit of Vatican II, like the hermeneutic of rupture. The second one is the hermeneutic of, of continuity, which was what I, you know, that I kind of saw that as being right. You couldn't just have um, a situation where you threw, uh, like, this is how I always looked at it. What are we going to do about it? You know, like, I don't, I'm, and having studied the documents for a long period of time um, properly, I kind of feel that I didn't really have a massive problem. I, you know, I've got some questions about Nostra Aetate <laughs> and, you know, but I think that, we can work through them theologically. I don't think they're a massive problem that is irresolvable. Um, and, and the alternative I've always kind of thought was, well, what are we going to do? We can't just say, oh, that didn't count and just carry on. But I've come to this new sort of through a lot of what I've, this is one of the things that Pope Francis has done for me, actually, is I kind of feel now when you look at the councils, there are some councils that were that spoke to a particular time and a particular problem. And that is how I'm starting to see Vatican II now. And I, it's not that I think um, we should cancel it or write it back or say it's not magisterial or anything like that. But um, I, get, I just feel like we should stop harping on. We should stop having it as the lens through which we see everything we do. Um, we should have a, a longer view about the church's mission because that hasn't changed. And, Vatican II doesn't change it. What it does is it, it's a lens that tries to focus it to the culture. And that's, a, you know, that's what we're, we're still trying to do that. Um, but I think we need to park some of this rhetoric now and just focus on being Christians, you know, and, and carrying on and following Jesus. I think that's much more important than all these ridiculous arguments. And I feel that the Pope, even though he spoke to it this week, he said that, um, I think it was on October the 10th, he gave a homily where he said, uh, that traditionalists and progressives are tearing their mother apart, you know. But he's the one who's doing it. He's the one who started all these wars, you know. And Pope Benedict was the one who was saying we're all one church. And I've always believed Catholicos, you know, universal. There's room for I don't. Some people like, um, you know, a more evangelical sort of liturgy. Some people like a more charismatic Catholic approach. I haven't got a problem with that. Some people like a more traditional approach or an Eastern Orthodox approach. I think it's that it's beautiful to see all those expressions of love of God in gathered together in one place. You know, that's absolutely beautiful that it's the unity that we've got in, in our diversity that makes us at the book that, you know, the, the, the city of God, isn't it? You know, so I, I've never had a problem with that. And I don't know why the Pope has decided to sort of pick fights and reignite liturgy wars. It seems completely pointless. And what's your experience of it, Catherine? You ever been to a Latin mass? Yeah, I've been to a Latin mass. Yeah, I think it's beautiful. So, so one of the things that strikes me is that I think when Pope Francis came in and he uh, said, I'm just going to wear a simple white robe and I'm going to do away with this, that it was this and that. These, It was almost like this sense that these are man-made artificial 
like symbols that mean nothing that it's it's a bit like we see in the gender ideology which is it's a social construct it comes from us it's not something we receive um and i think that what what i think is misunderstood is that when we have grand cathedrals and um certain vestments and the 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 the, the rituals that we have and the incense and the architecture and the art and the tabernacle the near tamid and and these things they they point to something else they point to something beyond and i think when you say i'm going to do away with that it's it's making it about the man and it should never have been about the man it's about what it points to so pope benedict didn't wear certain um items of clothing to draw attention to himself but to point to beyond himself to point to something transcendent um and so i think that's i mean my experience you asked me about my experience my experience is i like you know, i like the novus order i like i've had great experience wonderful priests i love the latin mass i get to that sometimes but it's that it's all you know it's not let's do away with this because this is and this is the some of the the rhetoric in in of what i'm seeing coming out from some people who are really stuck on a vatican too and i listened to a, a homily the other day where the priest was saying the synod of synodality is is all about listening but we're not listening to you <laughs> you know so it's it, in a way that they're, they're doing the very thing that they're accusing traditionalists of doing they're being very single-minded and um myopic and not seeing the broad beauty like you say the un the unity and the diversity well i was going to say uh with respect to the um the way that pope benedict used to teach one great example was his visit to westminster abbey uh when he wore pope leo the 13th stole the, the um the pope who famously issued the papal bull um gavin scon who issued the papal bull carry on that that said that um, Anglican orders were null and void. So, and that, it, it, it's very Pope Benedict that he was very, he was giving a very clear message um, and he was doing it in a very intellectual and gentle mm. sort of way, but he always stood with the church mm. and, you know, and, and we owe people the truth, don't we, Gavin? That's the, the whole point of being a Catholic, really, is that the truth is important. And when we try and mitigate it or relativise it, mm. we always end up, betraying up uh, like the truth and and christ ultimately yeah. i thought what catherine was saying earlier was putting her finger on it because <clears throat> she was talking again about balancing transcendence and imminence so you know we have these extraordinary buildings which and, and, and art and music. I mean, you think about musically musically i can find myself approaching god in worship singing a tese chant and i can do it singing uh singing lassus 16th century polyphony they're very different kinds of music one is one is intimate and simple and accessible and the other is I immensely ornate and sophisticated and, and 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 beyond my imagination harmonically but they're both ways of stretching human experience to encompass the way god approaches us the problem i have is is with what is happening at the moment is i think expressed best by what you were saying mark that if this is a hermeneutic of rupture then what we might find is that the rupture with everything before Vatican II catches up doctrine and morals as well. And my fear is that the, this, this atmosphere of discontinuity is preparing the ground to shift the church's understanding of sexual ethics. Mm. Because, um, and, and I think that's what I'm most afraid of. I, I, I mean, I'd be very, I'm very sad indeed for, for any um, so this this was the, the, the strategic mistake the Pope was making. I guess I didn't say this was was to attack the Latin Mass, where it's a place of growth, uh, where people are, are coming to the church. Um, but the idea that what we're really trying to do is to strip out the holiest and the most transcendent, uh, and then and then misuse imminence by treating it as a theological vehicle for our convenience that's a problem with it with imminent religion you have we have god on our own terms and the great danger is that by by defying by, by forbidding transcendence and awe and majesty and authority and pushing the whole imminent philosophical and logical agenda it's actually preparing to to change ethics so we have ethics on our own terms as well and that's the that's the way in which the whole change of sexual teaching is going, I fear, is being prepared for. And that's what I'm most afraid of.
Mm. I suppose that was what Cardinal Muller was warning about this week uh, in an interview on EWTN when he said, you know, that this was like they're, they're trying to destroy the church. I think, and, and I think a lot of people were shocked by the language that he used. And it was shocking language, you know, and like a lot of people were sort of saying, oh, you know, the gates of hell will never prevail. And, you know, yeah, I don't think that's what he was saying. What he was saying was that this this action is aimed at destroying the church. But do you know what? I don't think it will work, guys. And the reason I don't think it will work is because, um, obviously, of Christ's promise. But I also think that there will always be Catholics who believe in the faith. Yeah, there are wishy-washy people who... Uh, you know pick up bits and not other bits and one thing another but because it's true there are loads of good priests there are loads of good bishops and you know faithful lay people who will always want to be a part of this truth and that's how I feel it doesn't in a way increasingly it doesn't matter what you know the more idiocy that you know the more it seems irrational and I, I speak as someone who has long waited for documents to come out of Rome and then poured over them and read them and reread them and quoted them to my children. And, you know, I've done the same with Pope Francis' documents. And I just, you know, it's D minor stuff. You wouldn't have, you know, you wouldn't have got through my degree course, mate. You know, it's awful. And I, I just have to say it the way it is, you know, and it's embarrassing. And, uh, you know, it'll be over soon anyway. <laughs> the, one, the, two, the two things that I live with, I think, first of all, I remember the Arian crisis when 90% of the bishops were Arians. Mm. I mean, Arianism is dreadful because you don't get saved by Jesus. You get inspired by a moral figure and that's not Christianity. Mm. And so all the power of Christianity being saved by a God who loves you so much, he strips himself of, of his immortality and enters into your condition. That was lost and only a minority of, of bishops and theologians believed that. And that would have been a terrible time to have been a Catholic, but the, the church came through it. And Arianism was repudiated. I think the reason that might the, the hope you expressed, Mark, might be right, because liberal Christianity doesn't work. Uh, at the heart of Christianity is 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 sacrifice and purity. And without sacrifice and purity, there is no sense of the Holy Spirit. And without the Holy Spirit, there's nothing attractive about Christianity. It just becomes religion. It's a form of spirituality that helps people accommodate their mm. their, their their yearnings for the unseen God. So any any religion that does that will attract a few people, but it'll die out very quickly. Only authentic Christianity, where people are formed by Christ and he appears through their eyes and through their voices and through their actions and in them. That, that's, that is the only way of, of redeeming religion. Otherwise, religion is awful. <laughs> religion stinks. Most of us hate religion uh, in that sense. But this is because Christ has redeemed religion just as much as he's redeemed everything else. And I think the liberal way of trying to have God on the terms of our own self-indulgence, which is what the project is, uh, is, is fairly, will attract nobody. But the Holy Spirit will make real Christians who practice real sacrifice and real virtue, uh, which is what flows from the traditional morality. Amen. Amen. I think we'll have to leave it there for today, guys. I'm glad Gavin came back after freezing on most of us hate religion and uh explain that in a bit more detail um we'll we'll join i hope you can join us again for catholic unscripted episode six next time for now i'm Catherine bennett i'm mark lambert and i'm gavin ashington